Welcome back everybody. Rob from Crown of Thorns with another video for you. Again in front of the whiteboard. I am actually doing kind of a marathon day of recording if you want to consider it that. It is Thursday, July 18th and I'm recording, uh, I think this is the third video that I've done for today. And I think I might stop here because I have to edit and upload to YouTube and then I need to go to work tonight. So my time is limited today. But that's alright, I'll at least have three videos to put up and then uh, I'll be back in front of the whiteboard again here before too long. If you noticed, a little bit different setup configuration from where I'm usually at. Gives me much more light, a little more room, all is well with the world, kind of. Alright, but before we jump into our video, which is the four blood moons, I want to talk about salvation. The most important thing uh, that you'll ever, ever have to make a decision about in your entire life because all of your eternity rests upon this right here all right and salvation salvation is twofold right it's based on the who and the what who Jesus is you must know trust believe have faith that Jesus is God we have a triune God one God who manifests in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and then God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is God and you must believe that. Uh, and then the what? What Jesus did on the cross, the finished work of Christ. That is what we must trust on in order to be saved. All right? First uh, Corinthians 15, one through four, Paul, our apostle, tells us what we must do to be saved. We must trust on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Secondly, Romans 3.25, it says, Our salvation is through faith in his blood. It's that atoning blood of Jesus Christ that washes our sins away, which allows us to be forgiven, which gives us access to heaven. Ephesians 2.8.9 tells us that in this dispensation of grace, where we are right now, that salvation is by faith alone, not of works. If you're trusting in your works at all for your salvation, you are not saved. You must trust on this right here 100%. 100%. All right? Ephesians 1.13 tells us that when we get saved, we are saved by the Holy Spirit, that third person of our triune God. He lives inside of us, and we're sealed by that Holy Spirit, which means you cannot lose your salvation. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. All right, so let's jump into this week's video, The Four Blood Moons. Now, the first verse I want you to look at, and I'm going to put it right over here, is Joel 2.31. Joel 2.31. Alright? So Joel 2.31. Can you see that? Yeah. Says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Now what is the day of the Lord? Uh, I've done videos on this. The Bible will talk about the day of Christ, and it talks about the day of the Lord. There are some who believe that those are interchangeable terms, expressions. This means interchangeable, by the way. If you do this, definitely means interchangeable. <laughs> Not really. I have no idea what I'm doing. But uh, I do know that this is correct. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord are not the same. Not the same. The day of Christ is a one-day event. This rapture right here. The day of the Lord begins with the second coming, the battle of Armageddon, but it's this thousand year reign, this millennial kingdom. So that's a thousand year period, the day of the Lord. The day of Christ, one day event, the rapture, all right? So, Joel is telling us, hey, uh, the moon will turn into blood. It's gonna be a blood red moon. Wow, that's interesting. Now, we know, or we should know, if you've had your eyes open, if you've been listening, studying, observing, whatever else, that over the course of time, 
there have been four periods where there were four blood moons. We call them tetrads. Tetrid. There's a first tetrid, a second tetrid, a third tetrid, and a fourth tetrid. These blood moons line up and play heavily into Shemitah cycles. I've done a video, I've done a few videos on Shemitah cycles. Make sure you check those out. The blood moons tie into this. The blood moons give us a, a, an idea into the end times. It plays into the end times, definitely. All right? It's important. For those of you who are rightly dividing, you know that we're supposed to be looking for that day when, when Jesus comes back. But not only that, we're supposed to be trying to pin down when that's going to occur. And there's going to be a thousand people or a million people or 10 million people or more saying, whoa, Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour, only my father. And that is true. Jesus did say that. But he said that during his earthly ministry. All right, back here. We know that Jesus died, buried, resurrected, and then went up into heaven. He ascended into heaven and has been there for close to 2,000 years, sitting at the right hand of God. Now, I'm willing to bet, and I'm not, I'm not a gambler, I'm not a gambler, but I'm willing to bet that Jesus and God haven't just been staring at each other for 2,000 years in complete silence, just kind of looking at each other. No, I think they're talking. Why not? And I'm sure God has said, hey, Jesus, this is when you're going back. In fact, I know that because in Revelation 3.3, 3, let's go there. Go to Revelation 3.3. 3. It says this. Not only does Jesus now know when he's coming back, but he's, he's, giving, he's telling us, hey, you can know too. You can know it as well. This is Jesus speaking to John. Okay? Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And you're saying, yeah, that sounds familiar, and it should. But what, listen to what he's saying. He's saying, if you're not watching, I will come on you as a thief, and you won't know the hour in which I'm coming. Okay. Then conversely, what if I am watching? What if I am rightly dividing? What, what if I am doing studies and trying to figure this out and putting pieces together? What if I am watching? Well, then he won't come upon me as a thief, and I will know the hour in which he's coming. Jesus cut it right down to the hour, not just the day. We can know the hour. If I could, if I could just even get the month, I'd be happy. Or the year. <laughs> That'd be great. Because I think I know the month. I've done videos on that before. Jesus fulfilled the spring festivals during his earthly ministry. Ministry. Now, all that's left are those fall festivals, the first of which is the Feast of Trumpets. And Paul says, at the last trump, that day that rapture will occur. Well, when's that? The Feast of Trumpets. Typically September, mid-September. So I think I know, I think I know that he'll be coming in September during that Feast of Trumpets. I just got to pinpoint the year. And my videos on Shemitah cycles kind of take and, and give us a good idea as to where that I think is going to be, where it could definitely be. All right. Um, so watch the videos on Shemitah cycles for that. But the four blood moons play into that as well. But we can know when Jesus is coming back, and we should be trying to find that out. All right? We should be trying to find that out. So there, for those of you that are naysayers, those of you that keep running back to that verse um, of Jesus' earthly ministry, um, and put that into context. So, context. So, the first, what color marker do I want to use? I think I'll go with blue. Blue. All right. The first tetrad of blood moons happened, and you're going to notice that a lot of this plays in with Jewish history and in, in, in what affects the Jews. I get that. Israel. Okay. And I also get too that there's that verse that the Jews seek after a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. That is correct.
But whatever affects Israel affects the rest of us. And yes, it's the Jews that look for signs. And we, the Greek, Gentiles, those are of us that are not Jewish, are to seek after wisdom. And that's where we get and that's what we run to our Bible for. That's what you should run to your Bible for. That wisdom. Now I've used this analogy before. Uh, if I'm driving down the road and I'm I'm not hungry, so I'm not looking for a Burger King sign so I know where I can go to get some delicious food. Okay? I'm not looking for the sign because I'm not hungry, but but if I'm driving and out of my line of vision or my peripheral vision, I see a sign that says Burger King. I wasn't looking for it. It was there. And I noticed it. I looked at it. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. So even though I'm not seeking after a sign, I'm not praying for a sign. Lord, please put a moon here or there so I know what. No. But if those things are happening, I'd be stupid not to pay attention to it. So it's not about seeking a sign. It's just paying attention to the fact that the sign is right there. Take heed. You know what I mean? I'll tell you this. I like to drive. I do. And I like to get from point A to point B as fast as I can, as safely as I can. All right? I'm never, ever looking for a stop sign. Meaning I'm not looking forward to, oh, I can't wait to hit that next stop sign. So I have to slow down, stop, wait my turn, and then accelerate again. I, that, I don't enjoy that. I like roads that have no stop sign. I can just keep going. However, even though I'm not looking for a stop sign, if there's one there, I'd be stupid to not take heed, right? I could cause an accident. I could injure somebody. So if the sign is there, I'm not looking for it, but it's there. It's in my face. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to take heed. Excuse me. So that's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here. I'm not seeking after a sign, but if the sign's right there, I'm going to take it and apply wisdom to it. What does this mean? What could it mean? How does it affect the Jews, Israel? How will that affect the rest of the world? There's nothing wrong with that. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. All right? So, this first tetrad took place in 1493, 1494. All right? So, I'm going to write it down here. Uh, 1493, 1494. All right? 1493, 1494. And here's the amazing thing. This is how these four blood moons play out. All right? So, the first blood moon during this first tetrad, all right? The first one was on April 2... April 2, 1493. The second one was on September 25. Ah, what were we just saying about September? Feast of Trumpets, 1493. The third one was on March... 1494 and the fourth one was again September 15 1494 now <laughs> here's the amazing part and I'll put this in I guess black all right Oh, yeah. This first tetrad, April 2, or I'm not the first tetrad, this first blood moon, April 2, 1493, fell on Passover. The second one, September 25th, 1493, was on the Feast of Tabernacles, and I'm going to abbreviate that, Feast of Tabernacles. The third one, March 22, 1494. Did I get these dates right? Let me make sure. Yep, okay. Was on Passover.
and the one on September 15, 1494, Feast of Tabernacles. Now, how is it that those four blood moons always fell Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles? Do you think nature, the universe, <laughs> just made that happen, or just in all of its utter chaos of evolution and stuff just randomly happening that it just fell into place like that? I would say no. And as we move further along, I think uh, it becomes increasingly impossible for that to even be a possibility. No, there is a God who is orchestrating all of this and he's telling us something. All right? He's telling us something. So, how did this affect the Jews? Well, during this period of time, if you know your history, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in 1481, they conspired with Pope, what is it, Sirius? I can't read my writing. Pope, one of the popes anyway, conspired with the Pope, uh, which began the Inquisition in Spain. So King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella, they conspired with the Pope. Remember, the Catholic Church was extremely powerful back then. So they conspired together 1481, this is what starts the Inquisition in Spain. What is the Inquisition? We'll get there. The king and the queen were Catholics and they were anti-Semitic. That means they did not like Jews. They did not like Jews. Anti-Semitic. So, what do they do? They want to get rid of the Jews one way or another. That comes into play a whole lot throughout history. You see that. All right? So, the Roman Catholic Church, also anti-Semitic, began to torture and kill the Jews. Remember, this is right here, through this period right here, all right? Uh, open open anti-Semitism, uh, uh, sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church, began in 1492. Does that date sound familiar? 1492? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? 1492. Open anti-Semitism, sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church, began in 1492. The Jews had to live in separate quarters. Boy, does this sound familiar? Uh, they had to grow their beards out and they had to be assigned a yellow star of David. Does this sound familiar in a little more recent history? In fact, if you change some of these numbers around, uh, <laughs> right? A guy named Hitler come to mind? All right. So the Jews were no longer, uh, 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 they no longer had, could, could, could hold public office. They couldn't be doctors. They couldn't lend money with interest. Doesn't that sound familiar? Again, history repeating itself, right? So all these restrictions are, pla are placed on the Jews. They're, they're alienating them. They're isolating them. They're making life as difficult as possible for the Jews. They want them gone. Want them gone. All right? In less than 12 years, the Roman Catholic Church tortured and killed 13,000 Jews. 13,000 Jews. 12 years. 12 years, the Roman Catholic Church tortured and killed 13,000 Jews. That's like a thousand a year. And you might say, well, that's not a lot. It, and relatively speaking, it isn't, but you have to remember population was different then, and uh, you know people were spread further out. It doesn't matter if there's only one Jew per year. It doesn't matter. Torturing and killing people based on what their uh, ethnicity is or their religious background is never okay. huh? But the Catholic Church is known for that kind of stuff. All right. It's just funny how history tends to repeat itself, because we'd see that on a much grander scale <clears throat> later on. Yes? Right, uh, right around here. All right, so the king and queen, on March 30th, 1492, March 30th, 1492, they signed a decree ordering the Jews to leave by August 1st. All right, so March 30th, March 30th, I'm gonna put it here, March 30th, they signed the decree that the Jews have to be gone by August 1st. August 1. That's really sloppy writing. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. It was called the Edict of Expulsion. The 
edict of, of expulsion. It banned all Jews from Spain unless they converted to Catholicism. How about that? If you convert to Catholicism, then you get to stay, buddy. But if you want to hold on to your own religion, your own ethnicity, your own background, well, you got to get out of here. Uh, so March 30th, 1492, the decree is signed. The Jews have to be gone by August 1st. Now, the Jews were stripped of their wealth. The edict forbade them to take any gold or silver. They couldn't keep their gold. They couldn't keep their silver. Does that sound familiar? Not only just here with Hitler, but here in the United States during the Depression, when everyone had to turn in their gold and silver. Do you see how history repeats itself? So the Jews were stripped of all their wealth. This edict, this edict of expulsion, forbade them from having any gold or silver. But July 30th of 1492, which is one day before this, uh, the Jews that had not been converted or killed were expelled from Spain. 200,000 Jews. So by July 30th, one day before this, uh, this decree uh, uh, was to go into effect, already, if, if the Jews hadn't already, been, already converted to Catholicism or hadn't already been killed, then they were expelled. 200,000 Jews told to get out of Spain, move. Doesn't matter if you have, you have your home, your whole life was here, your business, your family, doesn't matter, get out, okay? So, what else happens in 1492? Well, like I said, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? Columbus is gonna set sail to discover the new world, and we know that's a big mess and all that good stuff. That's not what I'm here to talk about. But, he saved those Jews by bringing them to the new world. You may want to cut Columbus a little bit of slack. He helped to save, he helped to prevent the death of a lot of God's chosen people, the Jews. He did some good stuff. Now, I'm not saying that everything he did was right, and we know how history plays out and whatever else. Gotcha. But you also have to look at it from the other perspective. Those Jews would have been killed. Those Jews would have been uh, uh, tortured and whatever else, just like these other ones, had it not been for Christopher Columbus. All right? So let's go to the second one. The second tetrad. All right, this one takes place 1949-1950. Now, Israel became a nation in 1948. So this is all lining up again. 1948. By 1949, they were recognized by the UN and all of the surrounding nations. And I just did a video on this, the law of return. That happened in 1950. So all of this is happening right around the second tetrad. All right. Uh, so they're officially recognized in 1949. Um, after the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. 1959 is the uh, Law of Return, which allows family members to come to Israel to become citizens, etc. All right, watch my video on that for more on that. Okay, so, let me do it, and, okay, right here. So, the second Tetrad. All right. The first one happens... April 13, 1949. The second one happens October 7, 1949. The third blood moon is April 2, 1950. And the last one is September 26, 1950. All right. So we know that, excuse me, uh, in 70 AD, uh, Titus led the Romans into into Jerusalem and just decimated the entire city, including the temple, everything. All right, uh, go to Matthew twenty four two. Matthew twenty four two. 
which said, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The, the disciples were bragging about Jesus. Do you see this beautiful temple and the city and the wall? And boy, isn't this great? Well, Jesus, being God, he knew what was coming. And he said, look, there's going to come a time when none of this is going to be left standing. And sure enough, 70 AD, uh, to put down a Jewish revolt, uh, Titus leads the Roman soldiers in and they decimate the city. And the Jews go into exile again. All right, 70 AD. Uh, this is called the Diaspora. The diaspora lasts nearly 2,000 years, which is unheard of in all of history. Where are the Canaanites? Where are the Jebusites? Where are the Hittites? They're lost to history. They've either intermingled with other people and, and, and are now unrecognizable as what they once were, uh, or they've just gone extinct or whatever it may be. That happens when, when, when uh, a society uh, or, or whatever loses their homeland. They just, they go into uh, 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 they go into exile, they go and they intermingle, and they're just gone. They're lost to history. The Jews are singular. They're peculiar people. They're God's chosen people. They survive. They persist. They remain uh, their own. They retain their identity. And almost 2,000 years later, they get their country back in 1948. Unheard of. Don't tell me there's not a God. No, tell me there's not a God that's orchestrating all of this. All right? Because I'll call you a liar. Right after World War II, and, and again, we can draw all those comparisons. What was happening World War II and um, leading up to World War II looked a lot like what was happening back here, yes? Yeah. All right. So, we've got that. Uh, World War II centered around this. In fact, all of this takes place after World War II. Okay? All of this takes place after World War II. And I'll put that right here. I would say that's a major world event. Now, here's the thing. Again, and I'm going to have to abbreviate, this takes place on Passover. This one takes place at the Feast of Tabernacles. This one takes place on Passover. And this one takes place on Feast of Tabernacles. Now, like I said, for that to happen once is nearly impossible outside of a God, our God, orchestrating it. For it to happen twice, I would say is impossible. If this was just randomly happening, the universe was doing whatever, chaos somehow just brought this into alignment, which is bizarre and stupid to believe that, uh, is impossible. It's impossible. So how is this happening like this? Well, like I said, we have a God who controls everything, and he's orchestrating this, and it's playing out exactly how he, how he said it would, exactly how he wants it to. All right? So let's go to the next one. The third tetrad takes place uh, 1967-1968. I don't know how anybody can deny the existence of God. Um, there's just way too much stuff like this and other stuff. Uh, it, it's just amazing, isn't it, to look back and, and to look around and to see how God orchestrates all this stuff? I mean, I think it's amazing. I think that uh, you'd be a fool. In fact, the Bible says uh, only a fool doesn't believe there's a God. I don't want to be a fool. It, it, it's just amazing to see how God orchestrates all this stuff. All right. 1967, 1968, all right? And let me grab my book here. So, again, uh, the first blood moon, um, this takes place April, oops, April 24th, 1967. The next one is October 18, 1967. All right. I'm going to put some commas in there. The third one is April 13, 
1968. And the last one is October 6, 1968. All right? So, what's going on here? Well, in 1967, uh, Jerusalem reunited with the Jews for the first time in 1900 years. All right? So Jerusalem uh, is now uh, bringing back Jews for the first time in almost 1900 years. Now, what happens at this point, though, 1967, we have what's called the Six Days War. Six Days War. Six Days War. So the Arabs, they have 465,000 soldiers, 2,800 tanks, and 800 aircraft, and they surround Israel. All right? I'm not an artist by any means. Hopefully you can see this, but Israel kind of shaped I don't know, along the Mediterranean there. It's kind of pointed. It comes down, something like this. All right? Eh, you know, it's Israel. All right? And all around, like this, are all these Arab nations, and they want to wipe Israel off the map. In fact, they want to push Israel right off into the sea. All right. So Israel is now surrounded by 465,000 soldiers, 2,800 tanks, and 800 aircraft. But God protects His people. Now, we know that the Jews. Uh, they, they, did, they didn't accept their Messiah when they should have. They rejected him three times, in fact. The Jews are not saved. Jews can get saved the same way that we do in our dispensation of grace, but they do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They do not recognize Jesus as God. They are not saved. But God still takes care of his people, despite uh, their flaw, despite their partial blindness, as Paul calls it. So God protects Israel, and by the end of the war... There were 21,000 Arabs dead, only 779 Jews dead. <laughs> That's a big number. So, uh, 21,000 Arabs dead, only 779 Jews dead. Now, how, how can that be? when they were vastly outnumbered. Well, God takes care of his own. That's why. Uh, Jerusalem was returned to Israel and the Western Wall returned after 1900 years. So all this stuff. It's like, you know, the Arabs went in there with the intent to just wipe them out and it said Israel came out even farther ahead against all odds. Against all odds. But they had God. God was fighting for Israel. He takes care of Israel. All right? There was a land promise. Now, this is where we get into uh, some recent stuff. We know not right now that uh, Israel is under attack, okay? The Palestinians are always attacking the Jews. And I can't believe there are people out there who actually defend the Palestinians, who side with the Palestinians. If you're a Christian, or you know anything about your Bible, why on earth would you side up with the Arabs, the Palestinians? They are in violation. They're the ones who are wrong, not the Jews. Oh, the Jews came in and they displaced all the Palestinians. Wrong. That did not happen. You need to start reading real history and quit listening to the media. Okay? The media, it will, they lie. If you haven't figured that out by now, then you probably are past the point of any sort of help. The Jews were promised that land long before the Palestinians. Long before that. Go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. All right. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12. 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, that's Abraham's name uh, initially, and then God would later change it. But Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make of make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. 
and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Look, you want to bless Israel. You can differ with their religion. I do. You can differ with the fact that they rejected their Messiah. I do. I think they were dumb to do that. But they're still God's chosen people. And God says that if you bless them, then he'll bless you. You curse them, he'll curse you. That's all I need to know. That's it. Now, were there people in the land of Canaan before the Jews got there? They weren't technically Jews then, they were Israelites. Israel, doesn't matter. Yes, there were the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Electrolytes and this, then, that, and the other. All right? Uh, but those those countries, those nations, those people were so vile and wicked, so vile and wicked, incestuous, bestiality, offering sacrifices of their own children to their false gods, all kinds of depravity was going on. And God gave them how long? 400 years, the whole time that, the, uh, that Israel or the Jews or the Hebrews were in captivity in Egypt. The whole time that they were in Egypt, the Canaanites could have turned stuff around. They had 400 years to get it right, and they had no interest. So don't say God didn't give them a chance. He gave them 400 years. They chose not to. So God sent the Jews in. I'm just going to say Jews. I know Hebrews, it doesn't matter. Sent them in, and yes, he told them to slaughter them all. Women, children, men, the animals, all of it. And people say, oh, how cruel. God is so bad. No. You have to do a top to bottom cleaning if you want to get, uh, uh, if you want to purge it of sin, of, of disease, all that stuff. It's like this. Let's say you're ill and you go to your doctor and he's like, well, you have to take this antibiotic to get this virus out of you. And he'll say, take it for all 10 days. Even if you start feeling better, don't stop. Don't stop. Because what's going to happen if you stop at day eight, yeah, you feel great. But there's still some of that stuff in you. Now it's going to start breeding again. And you're going to get sick again. It will. It's going to infect you all over. Do it for the full 10 days. You don't want even one of those germs to live. So is your doctor cruel and unusual punishment because he doesn't want the germs to live? I'm sure you don't want them to live if they're making you sick. You keep taking that antibiotic for the full 10 days so that it's completely wiped out. Not even one germ, not even a little baby germ can live if you want to get better. And the only way that that was going to get better in that situation, in that part of the world, was to annihilate all of them. And it may sound cruel, but that's the harsh reality of it. And the fact of the matter is, at that point, that land became Israel. That land belongs to the Jews. God ordained that. God promised that land to the Jews. And for any country or person or whatever else to say otherwise is absolute heresy, blasphemy, ignorant, stupid, wrong. All right? So, anyway, I hope I'm driving that point home. All right, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, verse 16. Uh, okay. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Again, bringing them back, right? Giving them that land. Uh, same chapter, 18 through 21. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Camanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephams and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites and the Jebusites. In other words, all those people, gone. This land is now yours, Abraham, and all of your descendants. It is yours forever. Yes, when you guys foul up, I'll take you out. But you're going to get to go back. Just like when they went to exile in Babylon. Taken out, but they got to go back. Even most recently, 70 A.D., you're kicked out, but guess what? It took 1,900 years, but so what? God brings them back. It's their land. No matter how you look at it, it belongs to the Jews. Uh, and people say, oh, those aren't the real Jews. How do you know? How do you know? They look Jewish to me. You know? Uh, and I believe that they are the real Jews. Now, are they the upright, stand-up citizens and and uh, uh, followers of the Bible that they should be? No, most of them are secular. They have no interest in even their own religion. 
I mean, you have your Orthodox Jews, but even if they are interested in their religion, it, it, it's a religion of days past. They haven't been brought up to speed, right? But that doesn't matter. That's not for me to decide. God still protects them, considers them his chosen children, his chosen people, and God will go back to dealing with them during this seven-year tribulation period. God is not done with the Jews. Don't buy into this replacement theology. Don't buy into this dual covenant theology. Jews aren't going to go to heaven just because they're Jews. Jesus made that clear. There's not a separate path of salvation for the Jews right now. If they want to get saved, they can. But it's the same way that you and I got saved in this dispensation of grace right here. All right? So don't buy into that. But at the same time, that land belongs to the Jews. And those people that are there right now, they are the Jews. Those are the Jews. God can weed them out at another time when he's ready to. If there's some false ones in there. All right? Whatever. Anyway, so that's what we have for the third tetrad. For the fourth tetrad, from my blue marker right here. Oh, and by the way, that's just it too. Almost forgot. Just when these ones fell. I'm sure it's just a happy accident that it happened for the third time that it lands Passover, Feast of Trumpets, Passover, Feast of, or I'm not Feast of Trumpets, I'm sorry, Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, <laughs> somebody's wor at work here. Somebody's making this stuff happen, right? It has to be. This this can't be just a happy accident. This That's not even possible. It's not. I'm going to move to this side. Hopefully you can see this. I think I'm standing in front of it. This is God orchestrating this. Why on earth would these blood moons fall exactly on those Jewish festivals every time? Every time. That's you, If that's not making you think or making you reconsider your position on whether or not there's a God, then I, again, I can't help you. <laughs> okay? So, the fourth one, this very last one, this fourth tetra. Let me get my blue marker again. All right. And this happens as such. Uh, all right. April 15th. 2014, which by the way, this is, uh, yeah, 2014, 2015, this fourth tetrad. All right, the next one is October 8, 2014. The third one is April 4th. 2015, and the last one is September 28, 2015, and try to guess, <laughs> try to guess if it lines up with these uh, Jewish festivals again. The answer is yes, and I'm running out of room, so I really have to abbreviate, but you'll know what I mean. So it's Passover. Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, again, fourth tetrad, four times, four blood moons, perfect. Uh, again, if you're, if you're still scratching your head wondering, I wonder if there's really a God, uh, you might be past uh, the, the, the point of no return. I hope not. I'm hoping maybe this will make you think and you'll start to... Uh, you know, get a clue, as they say. So, now, this fourth tetrad, this is where it gets really interesting, this fourth tetrad uh, of these four blood moons, all right, happens during the ninth Shemitah cycle. And I'm going to abbreviate Shem cycle. So I'm running out of room. This is all happening during the, the ninth Shemitah cycle. All right? Now, the tenth Shemitah cycle comes along, 
And again, go back and watch my videos on the Shimita cycle so we have better understanding of this. But I don't have time to do a whole thing on that right now. How long am I right now? Yeah, I've only got like 15 minutes left. Okay, so this is happening during the ninth Shemitah cycle. Alright, all of this stuff. The tenth Shemitah cycle starts, or is taking place, and what happens here? Well, September 23, 2017. A very, very important date. What happens? Exactly 50 years after Jerusalem was returned to Israel during the Six Days War, 1967, exactly 50 years later, a guy named DJT, I'll leave it at that, I don't want my video taken down, comes in and makes a proclamation that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and moves the U.S. Embassy right there. First time in 50 years, 50 years, I'm just gonna put it right here, 50 years to the day, 50 years to the day. Now, see, uh, if you know your Old Testament like you should, and you know about the exile for the Jews, um, around 586 is the date I'm gonna use, 586 uh, uh, BC, um, the the southern tribe goes into exile. They go to they're taken to Babylon. All right, uh, Babylon. The Jews go to Babylon. They're in exile in Babylon for seventy years. All right, a decree is given by Cyrus so that the Jews can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And that's where Ezra and Nehemiah in your Bible. That's what's taking place there. Uh, Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the wall. Ezra goes back to make sure that the temple and the city get rebuilt. Okay, so all of this is happening by a decree by Cyrus. And Cyrus had been named long before he actually came into power. Into power. The Bible said, hey, a guy named Cyrus is going gonna, is gonna to come along and he's going to give a decree for you guys to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And sure enough, it happens. All right? So the Jews now consider... Donald Trump to be their current, their modern day Cyrus because of what he did when he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. That was major. That was major. That, that, sets, in, that sets in place a whole series of stuff that's going to take place, that's going to happen, that falls or lines up and leads us to this right over here. Everything is falling into place just as the Bible said it would. Everything is falling in place for this right here. When Jesus comes back at the rapture, all of this is leading to the rapture, the tribulation, the millennial kingdom, the second coming, all of that. Everything is falling into place. Now, you can say what you want to about Donald Trump. I don't know where you stand. I don't care. This is not a political channel. But it is dealing with history. It is dealing with what's going on here. And the Bible and history, are they're, they're intertwined. Okay? So Donald Trump, when he made that proclamation, they equate, the Jews equate Trump to, their, as a modern day Cyrus, because of what Cyrus did for them way back uh, here. Way back in this area. Okay? And when Donald Trump did that exactly 50 years after what happened here, the Six Days War, and set into motion all these things that are going to come, come, that are going to come into place that are taking us to this right here. Now, whether he did that intentionally or not, I don't know. Doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, it happened. It happened. All right? And that's where we're headed. That is where we're headed. All of this is so important. Now, like I said, that was during the 10th Shemitah cycle. All right, now, we know then, and I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, go and watch my video on uh, the law of return. It's gonna tie in with what I'm about to say right now, but I'm just about out of time, so I'm gonna keep this brief. There is coming an 11th Shemitah cycle. 
the 11th Shimita cycle. I'm going to abbreviate SC. It's not South Carolina, not South Carolina. The 11th Shemitah cycle, okay? And that 11th Shemitah cycle, I firmly, wholeheartedly believe is going to, uh, these Shemitah cycles, by the way, are seven years long. Every Shemitah cycle is seven years long. This 11th Shemitah cycle, I believe, is going to fall into place right here, line up perfectly with this tribulation. And if you know, Tribulation. Yeah. Daniel's 70th week, when God goes back to dealing with the uh, Jews. And all of this is about the Jews. 11 is the number of judgment. Well, what happens during the tribulation? Judgment. God's judgment, right? Um, <clears throat> so all of this, like I said, is falling into place exactly as it's supposed to. Now, I believe that this 11th Shemitah cycle. Um, will I believe that it's I believe that this is going to be 2030 that's how it's looking to me anyway this here the second coming the battle of Armageddon well if you count back seven years then the rapture 2023 you're like well that already passed yeah but if God's dealing with us on a Jewish calendar Okay, or dealing with you know because all of this pertains to Israel, um, it's still. Uh, yeah, um, gosh, what am I trying to say? Right now it's 2024 on our calendar. On the Jewish calendar, it's still 2023 until you get to September, when their Jewish calendar, their religious calendar, at the Feast of Trumpets begins a new year. So all of this could be still playing, coming into place, right here, right now. Yes, it's 23 on our calendar, or 24 on our calendar, but it's still 2023 on a Jewish calendar. But not only that, like I was talking about earlier, uh, the generation. A generation is between 70 and 80 years from the time that Israel becomes a nation again. Is it counting from when they became a nation, or is it counting from when they were recognized as a nation, or is it counting from when this law of return happened and the Jews actually came back to their nation just like when Cyrus made the proclamation that they could go back and rebuild watch my video on the law of return because I'm going with this date right here and you're counting out the Shemitah cycles the Jubilee all that stuff but this video ties in heavily with that one so watch them back to back however you want to do it but watch them um, this one the four blood moons and the law of return and then watch my other videos on Shemitah cycles. Some of the dates have changed, obviously, but the concept and the doctrine is still the same. And there's that back and forth. And in every video, I always say, you know, it, it can fluctuate because we're dealing with different calendars. Our Julian calendar, their religious Jewish calendar, the fact that our calendar has been messed up. It could be off by four years or seven years or this or that. Brother Breaker talks about this in, in the video that he just did. Uh, the the in our our uh, church service that we did just this past Sunday, uh, and I highly recommend that you go watch it. It's um, he's covering Daniel uh, chapter ten, I think it was Daniel chapter ten, the last four verses, and I just want to make sure I have that right, so that when you look it up, you can you'll find it correctly. Uh, but I've done videos like that too, but this one that he did is really super good, really good. So I highly recommend that you go. And check it out. Let me just make sure, though. I'm giving you the right information so you know what to look up. Daniel, yeah. Uh, chapter... Is it 10 or chapter 9? Yeah. Chapter 9. I'm sorry. We're starting 10 this coming Sunday. So, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And that ties in with all of this too. But go and watch that. Uh, Brother Breaker, his, uh, the Cloud Church. Just look him up on YouTube. Watch that video. Watch it. It's really good. And it all ties in with what I'm saying here. Um, and what I've said in my previous videos on Shemitah Cycles, the Blood Moons, End Times, whatever else. Um, anyway, so. That 11th Shemitah Cycle, the number of judgment, that's what this 
tribulation is, judgment, and it's all coming into place right now <laughs> as we speak. Uh, and it's just interesting that a Shemitah cycle is seven years long. Well, how long is the tribulation? Seven years. It just lines up perfectly. So that's what I have for you right now. The different calendars, I talked about that. Roman, Julian, Gregorian, Jewish, yeah. Psalm 9010, that's what I wanted to give you. Psalm 9010. Which says that a generation is between 70 to 80 years. So, the law of return takes pl took place in 1950 at 80 years because 70 wouldn't get us there. Nothing happened. We're still here. Would be 2030. Just like I was saying up here. And then go and look at, uh, you know, Agenda 2030. And that's all I'm going to say about that because I don't want this video or my channel taken down again. But look at all of that and start putting it all together <laughs> and tell me what you come up with. All right? So anyway, guys, that's what I have for you today. Um, and I think I'm going to be done filming. It's about 2.20. And I have to go to work here before too long, so i got to get some editing done. I filmed three videos today, so I was hoping to do four, but I got three out of four. That's not too bad. Um, so anyway, guys, questions or comments, leave them below. Um, just know that I'm praying for you. Uh, I, I ask that you would pray for us. Um, salvation, like I said at the very beginning of the video, if you're not saved, do it. Get there. It, it, your entire eternity rests upon that. If you are saved, what are you doing to bring others to this? To this right here. Are you handing out tracts? Are you witnessing? Are you soul winning? Are you making videos? Are you sharing videos? There's a million different ways that you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, witness to somebody to to get uh, the gospel to people. And I'm talking about this gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. There's so many different ways. And I know everybody has a different comfort level. Some people are not comfortable to walk up to just some random stranger and say, Hey, if you died today, do you know if you'd be going to heaven? Or whatever. Or strike up that kind of a conversation. I get it. But it's, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, you don't have to step too far out of your comfort zone when, you know, you leave the restaurant, leave a tract on the table. When I'm in Walmart, I go around and I just stuff tracts into pockets of the clothing there. Somebody buys that shirt to take it home and well, what's in my pocket? I tract. I, mean, I just, whatever, whatever it takes. Sharing this video and videos like it, just share it so that other people see it. Hopefully they come to Christ as well. We got to be doing our part. We have to be doing our part. We need to be. All right? So, if you're not saved, get there. If you are saved, help others to get there. All right? All right, guys. Anyway, take care. And God bless.